We're going to take a little bit of a turn in the notes this evening. Let's pick back up in John 14, 10. John 14, 10. And we were saying, I think, two, maybe three Wednesdays ago, Jesus acted on the word of his Father. And we see this in John 14, 10. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say, the words I say, Everybody say it out loud. The words I say. The words I say say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. It is the Father living in me doing his work. I think a lot of people get saved, and that's it. Uh, It was really sweet yesterday. One of our attorneys is probably on the brink of retirement, and he brought a younger attorney by and introduced us. And uh, But he was saying something you've heard me say, that the Bible never tells us to go and make converts. The Bible tells us to go and make disciples. Amen. And when you just get people saved, you know, brother, are you saved? Uh, they don't know how to walk as the believers in the book of Acts. I think it was two or three Wednesdays I pointed out that a lot of the stars in the book of Acts were people you never read about in the four Gospels. People like Barnabas, Saul of Tarsus. And uh, so the point is that if we would live our lives not like somebody that got saved and that's it. If we would live our lives as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ then we could say something like this with Jesus. It is the Father living in me who is doing his work. But see a lot of people have never been in a church and heard this type thing. They don't have a vision for it. And you know a lot of the good stuff in the positive motivational world are really just faith concepts from the word of God and one of them is this if you can't see it you can't have it if you can't see it you can't get there and see because if if people are in a church and this concept has never been lifted up that uh, you can do the works of God you can do the works of Jesus you're, you're just as born again as I am you're just as saved as I am well, then how are you going to move out? And uh, it's like testing the waters. How are you going to move out there and test the waters? Amen. So he said, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Now, we're going to take a little course correction not correction, but a little different path Uh, starting this evening. We're going to be here a week or two or three. And what we're going to do tonight and next Wednesday night for sure, I could just just do every Sunday to the end. I love this stuff. Um, In fact, I've thought about just starting with the wedding of Cana and just teaching on the miracles in the Gospels and the book of Acts. And how did they happen? But I just pulled four or five examples, just examples. Let's go to Matthew 8, verses 1 to 4. Matthew 8. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Now you have to understand, this is a, this is a communicable di- disease. This is contagious. And it's horrific. There was a man, a leper, used to sit outside the post office in Nairobi begging and when I would go to the post office, I would see him. It's horrific. Leprosy's horrific. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. No fear. But they were trying to tell us two years ago that Jesus would wear a mask. My, you know, I, I'm ashamed of a guy. I won't say what town he's in. Supposed to be word of faith, uh, wore 
those Playtex living gloves uh, laying hands on the sick during COVID. <laughs> Lord. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. So he had no fear. He said, I am willing. Say it out loud. Jesus is willing. Jesus is willing. Jesus is willing. Say it out loud. Jesus is willing. Jesus is willing. See, that's what I tried to get that young man to comprehend, apprehend, latch on to Sunday. When I said to him, you were healed 2,000 years ago Amen. on the whipping post and at Calvary's cross. But again, if, if, if people don't see it, if they don't have a vision for it, then they can't walk in it. You know, uh, I just love this stuff. And, uh, you know, I could park here. Four weeks ago today, I got hit with something. The challenge and the battle of my life. Four weeks ago tomorrow, I'm out praying and I just knew I was going to die. Something inside me caused me to, I mean, pain just buckled me over. I was out praying, and I counted to 14 and lost count. I mean, just buckle you over. And I'm thinking, man, you know, I need to go to the ER. I need to call Austin, have, me, have him drive me, whatever. And I, I, I thought, no, no. No, I'm going to power through this. Yeah. And, and this is the concept I latched on to. See, if, you, if you're trying to get healed, man, you're going to have a long wait. But I latched on to this. In fact, I, I started a series of confessions. I ought to do a booklet on it. Maybe, maybe I was in the school of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you one thing. I have compassion for people in pain. I, I'll tell you that. But anyway, so I started praying this way. Father God, in Jesus' name, you are an eyewitness to the fact that 2,000 years ago, Jesus put an, made an open show and spectacle of Satan on Calvary's cross. Father God, in Jesus' name, you are a witness that 2,000 years ago, Jesus put to naught every work of Satan on Calvary's cross. Father God, in Jesus' name, you are a witness that I have rebuked the devil and commanded him to take his hands off and named what the problem was Amen. or the symptoms. Father God, in the name of Jesus, you are a witness to the fact that I have pled the blood of Jesus over my body from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet and over and name those issues. Father God, you are a witness that I have believed the good report and I have confessed with my mouth. Jesus took up my infirmities and he bore away my diseases. Amen. Father God, in Jesus' name, you are my witness that I have believed the good report and I have confessed with my mouth that with the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. Amen. Father God, you are my witness in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I have re I have commanded my body to be healed and made every which way whole from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Father God, in Jesus' name, you are my witness. And then I would say, and based on these faith facts, Father God, to which you are a witness, I boldly declare, I am healed, I am whole, I am well from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. Amen. Well, that horrible pain went away you know, within a day, all pain went away within several days, and it took a while. But I'm here to tell you tonight, 28 days later, I am totally, absolutely, 100% completely healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, John G. Lake, I think we have his book in the cafe, John G. Lake taught that sometimes God's not doing us a favor when he heals us right away, a miracle. See, when you get a healing, when you cut your hand, does it heal instantly? No. What does it take? Time. Time. So when you have a healing instant, that's a miracle. Amen. But when you have a healing over time, it's still a healing. Amen. 
And John G. Lake taught on healing that he wasn't sure God did us any favors by giving us instantaneous miracles because he said, we thank God and we go on down the road and we don't learn how to fight. Now, the reason I was able to do what I was able to do is because of what I've been teaching the last month or two months here on Wednesday nights you have got to have faith in your faith. See, and the anointing with oil is great. Prayer of agreement's great. Laying hands on the sick is great. But if you stop and think about it, all of that is in a way having faith in somebody else's faith. But what if you're on vacation? What if you're visiting relatives in a place, you know, a godforsaken part of America, which there are plenty of? In other words, uh, you have to have faith in your own faith. Now, I wouldn't suggest starting with something that could be life-threatening. I I, that's why we're always saying, you know, work your faith on money. It's non-fatal. Believe God for a refrigerator. Believe God for a washer and dryer. Exercise your faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, so the procedure, here's what I did. Now you do what you want to do. Here's what I did instantly, instantly. I did a handful of things instantly. First thing I did, I went to what Sue and I call a word fast, instantly. Only the Bible or things about Christianity, nothing else. I'm talking about to put before your eyes. Second thing I did, I stopped praying. I have not prayed in four weeks. I just shifted gears and started praising. I'm not, I've not prayed in four weeks. Just praise. That's it. And then... Every day I was watching a message from the Praise Cure. It's on the app. Yeah. Pastor, where, where do we go for the best stuff? Faith Christian Center app. <laughs> and uh, so I'd watch one of those a day. Oh, and then I, besides my regular prayer time in the morning, I added 30 minutes in the afternoon. But it wasn't really prayer. It was praise. We who know God do not go into the ring with Satan to see who wins. We who know God go into the ring because we know that we are winners and victors in Christ. Amen. And it might take four weeks, but we win. Amen. You see that? We prevail. Amen. But this idea of trying to get healed is nothing but sabotage. We were healed 2,000 years ago on that whipping post. And we were healed 2,000 years ago on that cross. Well, then, Pastor, what are we doing? We are enforcing Satan's defeat and Jesus' victory. Yeah. You see, the work's done. See, if you're trying to get God to do something, you're defeated. The work's done. It's all done. Now, I hope I can get to some really great stuff here, but I just threw that out there. That's free. Lord, if you are will, that's where, I, that's where I got off course. Say it out loud. He is willing. He is willing. See, I, and never once did I say, Lord, uh, see, because he didn't know anything, God bless him. The leper didn't know anything. He didn't have a Bible. He didn't, I mean, he might have had an Old Testament. He didn't have a New Testament. He didn't know anything. Don't be asking the Lord if he's willing. Amen. And don't be coming up to me and say, well, I'll see you Sunday, Pastor. Lord willing. I always say the same thing. He's willing. Yeah, but what if the rapture happens? I'll still see you Sunday. Right. <laughs> Amen. 
I am willing, he said, be clean. Now, notice what he did. He touched him, fearless, and he said two words. We make a mistake oftentimes when we pray for the sick, when we pray a lot of words. And what I discovered as I got older was I prayed a lot of words trying to convince the person who needed prayer that I was doing a good job. I was, give, I was, do, I was praying my best prayer. And I know in the early days, I don't think they think that of me anymore, but I remember, especially with Sophie, some, you know, sometimes they'd, they'd bring Sophie to me and, and I would just say, you know, a handful of words. And, you know, it's like my family looks at me like, is that all you got? Well, that, well that's all it takes. Amen. So he said, be clean. Now, the thesis tonight is all Jesus' works were a result of his words. All Jesus' works were a result of his words. And remember what he said in John 14, 10, the words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. See, when we enforce Satan's defeat in our money, in our families, in our bodies, it is God working through us, making the enemies of Jesus his footstool. Amen. See, that's Satan's place, the footstool of Jesus. But see, he wants, and, and what is his gift? How did he get Adam and Eve out of that garden? What is his gift? Deception. And our job, we're, we're not trying to get God to do something. If you're trying to get God to do something, you're defeated. Our job is to enforce what Jesus did and enforce Satan's defeat because he is defeated. But if he can get you to thinking that there's some kind of cosmic battle going on between God and Satan, well, then you're, you're defeated because you're waiting on God to do something and the work's done. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. Don't want to get into that. Jesus knew he was going to the cross, but of course he didn't want to go premature. So that's why he would tell people, don't tell anyone. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, this is what's unusual in this miracle is the action happens after. But I want you to see that even though Jesus did not require action from this man, he did require action from this man after the fact. Can you see that? So Jesus spoke the word and the man was immediately cured of his leprosy. So Jesus' faith was in his word. Jesus' faith was in his word, and he did these miracles by his word. Let's go to another one. These are just a handful of examples. Matthew 8, 5, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. Again, we see the willingness. And so when these ministers... Make out like sometimes it's God's will to heal and sometimes it's not. They're doing enormous damage to the faith of God's sons and daughters. If it were sometimes God's will to heal and sometimes God's will not to heal, somewhere in the four Gospels, he would have said to somebody, hey, buddy, you're not on the list. <laughs> but he never did. He never denied Healing to anybody. Now, the Syrophoenician woman, he did resist her request because she was outside the tribe of Israel, but because of her excellent faith-filled answer, he granted her request. He never denied healing to anybody. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. That's, immediate, that's the immediate answer and response. And remember, 
Another egregious thing ministers do is they draw this dichotomy between Father God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is nonsense because Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You want to know what Father God's like? Look at Jesus. Amen. 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 Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve The, the, <laughs> the centurion replied, and I told somebody that works for me, I knew that I knew that I knew that if I could beat it by faith, I'd go to a new level. I was watching Sunday morning, and I, I saw myself stagger under the power of God, and that's, that's why I just had trouble reading. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for another level. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for another level at Faith Christian Center. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This, <laughs> thank you. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word. These words got the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ. The centurion. Now, what was a centurion? He was a Roman soldier. He was an, part of the occupational army. What was a centurion? A commander over 100 men. And he had more faith than anybody Jesus came across. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. Just say the word. See, my God, if we could only learn to live by what God has said and not go by what other people say. But just say the word and my servant will be healed for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go when he goes and that one, come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And what was the faith? Just say the word. I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13, then Jesus said, see these miracles are all based on words. We live in a land of liars. Amen. These miracles were all based on words. And Jesus said to the centurion, go. It will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. But now notice, Jesus said, go. It will be done just as you believed it would. But if he had been a lot of if he'd been like a lot of believers I know, he'd have hung around and say, well, how, how do I know my servant will be healed? Don't, or, or, or like, uh, like Naaman the leper, he would have been offended. Is that all you got? You know, you're not going to lay hands on me. Uh, you know, you're not going to give me a prayer cloth. You're not, see, well, you see what I'm saying? Go. And it will be done just as you believed it would. He was requiring action. Amen. So something said and something's done. So Jesus spoke the word and the servant was healed that very hour. So Jesus' faith was in his word. And all Jesus' works were a result of his words. Mark chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, when it says he preached the word to them, what word, what word did he have to preach? Talk to me. What word did he have to preach? The Old Testament. There was no New Testament. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, you know, tile roofs like you see in the Middle East. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus after digging through it, lowering the mat, 
the paralyzed man was lying on. So what do we have here? We have action. They took action when Jesus saw their faith. This is one of the most remarkable clauses in the New Testament. When Jesus saw their faith. And people, you know, I've preached on it a hundred times and people don't apprehend it, comprehend it. When Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith. See, when you give in the offering, you could say to yourself, when Jesus saw their faith. Why would you? I mean, think about all the things you would, you would not do unless you were really a believer. Amen. I mean, and who would tithe? I mean, really? <laughs> right? When Jesus saw their faith. So action, they took action. Say it out loud. Faith can be seen. Faith can be seen. Say it again. Faith can be seen. Faith can be seen. He said... He did what? He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But now both of them have to do with saying. It's about the saying. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, see, he says to the person with the challenge, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now you know, I know, God knows, they knew that a paralyzed man can't get up, take his mat, and go home. Unless he has what? Faith. You wouldn't even try. You wouldn't even try to get up. Unless you had, unless you had faith. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. So we have again, what do we have here? We have action. He took action. Even a paralyzed man had to take action. And see this, this thing of, it's not that I'm unsympathetic when I say these things. I want you to see how damaging it is to live in a culture and a society of whining and crying. It's not, that I, it's not that I'm not sympathetic, but I've learned this. I've been doing this. I know it's hard to believe, but next uh, June, I will have been doing this 50 years, and I, I've learned one thing. Me feeling sorry for somebody accomplishes nothing. But if I can teach someone how it works in the things of God, well, now we can get something done. But me feeling sorry for somebody, that doesn't accomplish anything. So even a paralyzed man had to take action. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus' faith was in his word. All Jesus' words were a result, all Jesus' works were a result of his words. Matthew 5, 21, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Again, what do we see right here about the heart of God, the heart of Jesus? He's willing. Right? He's willing. Yeah. Say it out loud. He's willing. He's willing. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Now we have like a parenthetical miracle inside this story. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, this is not criticizing doctors. 
but let's face it, you can go see doctors and maybe they can figure it out, maybe they can't. You can go see a dozen and every time you go, you got a, you got a copay, uh, you got prescriptions. I mean, it costs money. By the way, last four weeks didn't cost me a dime. Might have cost me a tithe. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse when she heard about Jesus. And that's key. What are we talking about? I mean, we just come, came through a, an election and we won't know the results, you know, for a month or two. <laughs> but what are we talking about? She heard. So if I, I, we don't know if she was uh, at the market. We don't know if she was down at the river washing clothes. But think about all the things she could have heard about. But somebody was talking about Jesus. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When she heard about Jesus, what are we talking about? Let me tell you what. That weeping and gnashing of teeth and that, that place where there'll be darkness and all of that, we're going to be surprised who's there because we got a whole lot of people not talking about Jesus. They're talking about their favorite politician. No man's going to save you. And I know this, no man can heal you. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. So what's that? And he had, we know from a few verses later, there was a great throng about him that day. And remember, she had suffered from an issue of blood for 12 years. What happens when you lose blood? You become anemic, don't you? What happens when you lose iron, when you become anemic? You get weak. But she pressed through that crowd. What are we talking about? Action. She took action. Because she thought. King James says, for she said. So now we have confession. She said. See, every miracle Jesus did, he did with words. Yet, what are we saying? Minister sat all the way through Lillian B. Yeoman's class on healing when she used to teach in Bible school. She was an MD. And uh, toward the end of the semester, at the end of the class, this young man went up to her and said, uh, Dr. Yeoman, would you, would, you play, would you please pray for my flu? And she just went ballistic. Your flu, your flu, your flu. No point in me praying about your flu. She said, it's the devil's flu. And you were healed 2,000 years ago. So long as you say, it's your flu, there's no point in praying about it. See, what are we saying? And let me tell you what. I'm sure we have all kinds of faults, but we stayed with the Bible. And I don't know what in the world is going to happen with these ministers that took the Bible out of their sermons because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If there's no Bible in the sermons, how's anybody going to have faith? How is anybody going to know how to believe God for anything? Amen. Maybe that's why they're looking to man to save them. Because she thought, King James says, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. So we have confessions. She said something. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we saying? See, every miracle Jesus did, he did with words. And he had faith in his words. So what are we saying? And what are we doing? 
Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. I've always thought, found this to be one of the most interesting verses in the entirety of the word of God because he didn't even know power had gone out of him until it had gone out of him. There was no volitional act on the part of Jesus. This more than anything tells me the will of God. You can tap him without him even agreeing to it. That is how much it is the will of God for his children to be healed. So asking God to heal us is fruitless. Pleading with God, begging with God to heal us is fruitless. That's why I shifted gears and now I've thrown down. I've told them, you want any praying out of me? Everything stops. We're going to stay right here because I got two things left in my body that I've just put up with for a while. I told them, no, nope, I'm in the mode now. I'm in the zone. We're going to stay right here. We'll get this knocked out. I told Sue, then I'll be perfect. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why not? You know, if you're fishing in a real good spot, you don't move the boat. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you as disciples answered and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Some of the most amazing words in the entirety of the word of God. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. I think it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was a Sunday or Wednesday, it was in the last 30 days, I said that faith is the greatest power on the planet. And when you have faith in God, when you have faith in the word of God, you can do things other men cannot do. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. See, somebody could stand around pleading with God to heal them, begging God to heal them, uh, whatever they're doing, you know, drinking anointing oil, uh, you know, whatever they're doing, Daniel fast, January, Dan, you know, because a, Jan a January Daniel fast just has extra traction with the Lord, supposedly. <laughs> uh, but while people are doing all that stuff, see, he said, daughter, your faith, not, not Jesus, not somebody else, not the pastors, not the evangelists. Your faith has healed you. Get it? Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter's dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? And some more of the most important words in the Bible, verse 36, ignoring what they said. And if you have not figured it out, I have mastered this. <laughs> Ignoring what they said. Don't go by what other people say. Great revelation. Don't go by what other people say. Go by what God has said and go by what you have said. Remember, every miracle he did, he did with words. And Jesus had faith in his words. By, by the Spirit of God, two or three Sundays back, I said in a service, you may not make money in 2023 the same way you made money in 2021, but you will make more money in 2023 than you made 
in 2021 or 2022. Hallelujah. See, you, you, you just have to believe. And then, what are we talking about tonight? Take action. See, faith. And he said to her, or, or, or no, here in verse 36, ignoring what they said. So ignoring what they said. I don't even know who the heck they are anyway. You see? And isn't it fascinating, the biggest loser in town the person who's been divorced five times, the person who's on welfare, you know, your, your relative who can't hold down a job. Isn't it amazing the people who dispense advice? And brothers and sisters, you have to ignore what they said. Amen. Amen. And you have to go by what the word says and go by what you say. And that's why you got to master what you say. Don't let your tongue just flap around. You know, like some dog panting. You know how the dogs, you know, their tongue just goes, don't be like that. Be deliberate. If you don't know what to say, shut up. Amen. Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid. Just believe. King James says, fear not, only believe. Now, this is insane. Because the girl's dead. Fear not. Thank you. Only believe. Fear is the enemy. And what did they try and sell to the whole world two years ago? Fear. Fear. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of Jesus. So in other words, now, not even the, tw not the 72, we don't need them. Not even the 12, we don't need them. Only that inner circle. There are times in life you got to keep your circle small. Amen. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. You know, I've just seen some amazing things in my life. I've seen people try and pull somebody out of a casket, you know, just going crazy. People are amazing. I mean, if, if they're lost, well, gee whiz, that's terrible. If they're saved, they're with the Lord. So there's no point getting all crazy about it. We had a couple back up at I-30 and uh, had a child born, stillborn, but it was born. It wasn't a miscarriage. It was born. State of Texas, you have to bury him. And uh, so soon I get to the funeral home and they're in there with this baby and then a member of the church that with zero faith and total sympathy. And uh, so I walked into the room and I just looked at this other, this church member and I went like this, you know, just dismissed him. And I stood there, I've learned over these 50 years, when you don't know what to say in a situation like that, just stand there and grieve with them. They're not expecting you to have some magic words, just stand there and grieve with them. I stood there for, you know, five or 10 minutes. And then I said to them, I said, my brother and my sister, that beautiful child is gone and you will go to that child, but that child will not come back to you. And there's no victory in this room. So I said, it's time to go. And see, that was that woman's challenge. She had, she had uh, issues, couldn't have children, you know, miscarriages, issues. And uh, a prophetess over there laid her hands on her. Two or three children, 
each time had to lay hands on her, two or three children. This is the stuff that amazes me. But they changed churches because some church offered them $35 a week to run the soundboard. This is the stuff that amazes me. I didn't do anything. A lady over there did it, laid hands on I'm saying, people pick churches for the oddest reasons. Amen. So, he came to the home of the synagogue ruler. Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. See, there's no victory in that. We understand, we sympathize, we empathize, but there's no victory in that. He went in and said to them, what did he do? He said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? Well, that's not really very sensitive, is it? Well, do you want empathy or do you want the power of God? Do you want empathy or do you want a demonstration? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. They laughed at Jesus. They laughed at the Son of God. They're laughing at Jesus out here up and down the highways and byways. Amen. After he put them all out. And there are people, there, there are people here tonight and you're not going to get a miracle until you put some people out. Now I'm not saying you got to disassociate with them. But gee whiz, you know, it's like plutonium. You know, I don't need to be around it that much. <laughs> and you say, well, plutonium's toxic. Well, there are plenty of toxic people. Yeah, man. Amen. And you hang around them, and what's on them will get on you. And a lot of what's on them is unbelief. He put them all out. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him. So think about this. No crowd, the mom, the dad, Peter, James, and John. That's it. And went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum. That's Aramaic, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Well, now he's just gone too far. I mean, you know, he's just not sensitive. He told that poor paralyzed, paralyzed man to get up, take his mat, and walk. But now he's telling this dead girl to walk. Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. So even a dead girl had to take action. Look, if... if <laughs> If Jesus of Nazareth demanded action from a dead girl, why, what makes the church in America think that Jesus is not demanding action of them? Amen. You know, the other night we were watching the Ten Commandments and Moses is there and he's on the holy ground and, and, and you know, God makes some demands. And I, I paused it. And I told Sue, so I said, what makes people think that you could meet God, connect to God, and him not make a demand? You know, I was saved. I was called. I was born again. I was in the ministry. But I didn't know anything. We came home from a Saturday night potluck late winter, early spring of 1982, and where do you think Pastor Gene was? He was in the refrigerator looking for something Sue had made instead of, you know, what, those women that, from that potluck. And, uh, and I'm in the refrigerator, and the Lord spoke to me. As clear as I've ever heard him, he said, tomorrow you begin a 40-day fast. I never fasted. I don't think I'd ever, I don't think I missed a meal. And so I headed out. 39th day of that fast, I was praying the way I used to pray, and, uh, but when I say the way I used to pray, you know, 15 minutes. And I was sprawled out in the back bedroom of our house. And 
And they, he thundered. He thundered. Stand up, for I will demand of thee. It's amazing to me. People think they're going to meet God, connect to God, know God, and he won't make a demand. Of course he will. Of course he will. Now, you can go years. and I mean, it, I, I can't remember the last time the Lord told me to do something. It's, it can be a long time. We get, the, we get a wrong impression. I, I, Austin's on the edge of his seat. I know that. So <laughs> we, we, get the, we get the wrong impression. We, we read like Abraham, and God said this, and God said that, and, and, you know, Abraham's out, sees three men walking. We get the wrong impression. But if you, if you go to the book of Genesis, and you look at how long he lived, and you looked at how many times, and you look up how many times God spoke to him, God only spoke to him once every 20 or 30 years. I mean, I'm talking about on average. Now, I'm not saying it'll take that long for God to say something to you, but what I'm saying is he doesn't come along every day of the week and ask this and demand that. He's, that's, not, that's not his way. But when, but when you connect, don't be surprised if he makes a demand. But oh my gosh, what a joy it is to know him. What a privilege, what an honor it is to serve him. And what a privilege and what an honor it is to obey him. Because all there is in consequence is reward. Hallelujah. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Immediately the little girl stood up and walked around. So even a dead girl had to take action. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Because if you remember, if I remember right, is, is it John 10? It was raising Lazarus from the dead that got him killed. And that's why he was, you know, constantly saying, don't, don't tell anyone. Because he wanted to fulfill his mission and fulfill his purpose. Say it out loud. Jesus' faith was in his word. Jesus faith was in his and word. all Jesus' works were a result, a result of words, of words.